Welcome, uh, welcome to uh, this evening's lecture. I'm Professor Phil Gilmartin. I'm uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Sciences here at UEA, and uh, I'd like to offer you a very warm welcome to, to this evening's event. It's a very great pleasure for me tonight to be able to introduce Professor Chris Bowler, who is a visiting professor at the, uh, to the School of Environmental Sciences here at the University of East Anglia. So tonight's opportunity for this lecture is to introduce uh, Chris as a, a new visiting professor who has a number of links and established uh, collaborations here in the school. And tonight is an opportunity for him to share his, uh, his research more widely with, uh, with, with, with you as an audience. In addition to his role as visiting professor here at UEA, Chris is the director of, the, of research at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, or CNRS, and is the director of the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology section of the Institute of Biology at the L'Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. I first met Chris when he was an undergraduate, and I was a postgraduate student at the University of Warwick. Chris was studying for a, a degree in microbiology and microbial technology. He then went on after completing his PhD to the University of Ghent, where he um, obtained his PhD with a thesis entitled Superoxide Dismutase and Stress Tolerance in Plants. He then went on to postdoctoral studies with the Professor Nam Hai Chua at the Rockefeller University in New York. And again, our paths crossed there as we overlapped as postdocs in that lab for a number of years. When Chris left New York, he established his own research group working on signaling in plants and marine diatoms, a whole new venture that he, that he started up uh, at the Station Zoologica in Naples in Italy. In 2002, he moved to Paris where he took up his current position. Chris is the recipient of the CNRS Silver Medal in 2010, a European Research Council Advanced Award in 2012, and the Louis D Foundation Prize from the Institut de France in 2015. His major research interest is in the understanding of responses to pl plants and marine diatoms to environmental signals. In marine diatoms, he established the necessary molecular tools to assess gene function, and he's played a major role in coordinating whole genome sequence analysis of several species. Using functional genomics, Chris's research has advanced understanding of how marine diatoms react to a variety of environmental factors, including the presence of certain minerals, chemical compounds, and light. In tonight's lecture, Chris will introduce his role as scientific coordinator of the Tara Oceans Project, a multidisciplinary research consortium whose aim is to understand the data collected from the research schooner Tara. The vessel gathered information at more than 210 sites in all the major oceanic regions of the world during expeditions from 2009 to 2013. It was a hugely ambitious project to further our understanding of the marine ecosystems. Some of you will have seen an issue of Science last year with uh, a sea of diatoms on the cover. Chris had no fewer than five papers within that one issue, and I think some of the work that was in that uh, issue of Science will be talked about tonight. So it's a tremendous pleasure for me to, understand, uh, to, to introduce Chris, who I've known for many, uh, many years, here for his inaugural lecture tonight, and welcome him as a visiting professor at the School of Environmental Sciences. Chris. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Phil. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to, uh, to have this occasion to, to share our work with you and uh, to be an uh, uh, honorary professor at the UEA. And I hope this is the beginning of, uh, of several uh, fruitful uh, collaborations with, uh, with people that I know already uh, here and hopefully other, other people as well. So today I'm going to give you um, an overview of, of, of the Tara Oceans project, uh, which Phil began to introduce to you. Um, so the, the project is quite unusual. It's a scientific project, but it's unusual in, in, in several ways. Um, on, on, on one hand, uh, because uh, a lot of the work is based on a sailboat, a research schooner you see here. It's 36 meters long. We can have about... Uh, 14 people on board, which is usually half scientists and half sailors. Um, and so Tara Oceans was based on uh, using this boat over, over four years of, of scientific exploration. Um, the project is also unusual because the, the, the boat um, is, is not owned by a scientific organization. It's owned by a fashion company called Agnès B. 
okay, which some of you know, and <laughs> not everybody maybe. Agnes B is, I like to think of her as like the equivalent of Mary Quant um, in, in the UK, who at least uh, the, the, the non-teenagers here should, uh, should know who Mary Quant is. So Agnes B was a fashion designer. She became very, very uh, well known in the, in the 60s, 70s, made a personal fortune uh, uh, through her fashion company. Uh, which is now run by, by her son, Etienne Bourgois. <clears throat> and she very graciously, uh, uh, she, she um, sponsors a lot of um, cultural activities in, in the arts, um, museum exhibitions, artwork, uh, uh, literature, and so on. Uh, but very unusually, she also uh, supports scientific endeavors uh, through uh, this sailboat called Tara, which, uh, uh, which she has owned for uh, about 15 years now, and basically any scientists who, who have an idea that she thinks is, uh, is particularly important, and I'll talk about the reasons why, uh, in her view, things are important a little bit later, hopefully, uh, she will basically lend the boat out uh, to be used for, uh, 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 for the research project. So, so that's what we did um, in, from 2009 to 2012, um, using the boat, um, in the project that we call Tara Oceans, which was run uh, by uh, uh, Eric Carcenti, who is a very well-known cell biologist. Uh, he's, uh, he's worked at the EMBL. He was director of the cell biology division at EMBL in Germany through his scientific career. Uh, and he's also a sailor. Uh, 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 and, and he had the, uh, the, the idea to really start this project in, in the beginning. So it's really Etienne and Eric who are the, uh, the, the founding fathers of, the, of this whole project. So um, basically what we wanted to do in this project um, is study um, everything that's invisible in the ocean. Um, if you think about ocean life, you might think about sharks and fish and dolphins and things you see on television. Uh, but there's, there's a whole multitude of life uh, uh, that is also present in the ocean uh, that you need a microscope to see. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's uh, grouped together as conveniently as plankton, um, which are basically uh, uh, drifting organisms, organisms that drift with the currents um, uh, uh, autonomously. Um, and there's different kinds of plankton that you can see in this, uh, in this mandala that I'll introduce you to uh, a little bit later. But if you, if you do some back-of-the-envelope calculations about how much uh, life does this uh, microscopic world represent, uh, you come to the realization that it represents more than 50% of the biomass in the ocean. Uh, probably uh, quite a lot more than that, but that's a conservative estimate. Um, this, this, these organisms represent about 50% of, of the total biomass in the ocean. They do all kinds of uh, very important things, which, we, which we've known about for quite some time. Um, they are the basis of, of essentially all of the oceanic food webs. Um, there are photosynthetic plankton, uh, uh, which, just like plants, uh, will take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and will generate organic carbon, just like plants. <clears throat> and in doing so, they also generate oxygen. And uh, uh, so about half of the photosynthesis that happens on, on the planet uh, happens in the ocean. Um, so it's an incredibly important source of, uh, of, of oxygen and of primary production through photosynthesis. Uh, that we often neglect. We think of photosynthesis as being forests and, and, uh, and, and savannas and so on, but, but the oceans are also incredibly important. And as I will allude to a little bit later as well, uh, uh, the, the plankton also represents arguably the most important biological carbon pump on the planet, um, meaning as these, these organisms take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they bring it into the ocean, so the very important buffer against uh, climate change mediated, global warming mediated by higher CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and then when these organisms die, a small fraction of them will, will sink to the bottom of the ocean. And because the ocean is deep, they can take that carbon out of the carbon cycle for very, very long periods of time um, and ultimately will generate our, our fossil fuel res reserves, our oil and gas, our plankton, uh, that have uh, uh, sunk to the bottom of the ocean over geological time scale. So it's a very, very important process that, that buffers, that really ensures the well-being of, uh, of planet Earth 
actually making it uh, habitable for, for, for organisms such as ourselves. Um, and we know from a lot of studies of the geological record and, and others that the plankton, uh, uh, they can affect climate and they can also be affected by uh, climate changes. So there's a, there's a two-way feedback between uh, climate and, uh, and, and these uh, uh, biological uh, uh, entities that we, uh, that, that we need to know, that, that we know a little bit about, but, but we're certainly far from understanding the whole thing. <clears throat> so these are the organisms that we wanted to study. You can see a bit of a panorama of, of these organisms in this image here. Uh, but let's just go and look for a second at, at what these different organisms are. Um, one group of organisms are, um, uh, are grouped into uh, 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 what we call protists. These are unicellular eukaryotes or micro eukaryotes. Uh, uh, so these are eukaryotes, so they have cells just like ours. Uh, uh, but they're single-celled, typically, as you see in these, these examples here. There are different kinds of protists. Some of them are photosynthetic, like the, these, di these boxes here. These are diatoms, which is what we work on. These are chains of diatoms. So these do photosynthesis like the plants on land. Uh, dinoflagellates do similar things as well, as you see here. And there are all, all kinds of different organisms within this, uh, this protist world that adding them up together uh, uh, collectively can represent up to 10 million cells in an average litre of seawater, okay? So that's one group of organisms we're interested to study. Um, uh, uh, on top of those, the, the larger organisms are the zooplankton, which typically will eat the, uh, the phytoplankton, the protists. Again, different shapes and sizes. Some are like little shrimps that we call copepods. Uh, uh, some are like small snails and so on. And these can be present at up to 100 uh, uh, organisms in an average liter of seawater. <laughs> and then going smaller, we've got the bacteria, <clears throat> the microbial world uh, present within these communities, which uh, can be represented by up to 1 billion cells in an average liter of seawater. And then even smaller than that, we've got the viruses and the giant viruses uh, that we call gyruses. And these guys can be present at up to 10 billion particles per litre. Okay? These are not toxic for us. They're not pathogenic for us, but they're pathogenic against the other organisms that are part of the planktonic world. And they, they assure sort of turnover in the ecosystem. They ensure that excesses are not, uh, are not tolerated. So they sort of lubricate the ecosystem and ensure that, uh, that, that things are, uh, are maintained at equilibrium. So there are different kinds of organisms present in different uh, numbers, as, as I've introduced you to here. Um, they're also present at different sizes, which I think you can see nicely in this electron micrograph movie. Here we have a copepod, which is a zooplankton, with a <coughs> diatom sitting on it and a bacteria sitting on the diatom. Okay? So we're going from the zooplankton to the phytoplankton diatom to the bacteria here. And if we had a virus, a viral particle, it would be sitting on the, uh, the, the bacteria. So these are, there's a huge uh, uh, range of, uh, of organismal sizes, um, which would represent something like going from an ant to a brontosaurus. Okay? If, so this is what we want to study in this project. Um, uh, we, and we wanted to study all of these organisms together uh, to really put the biology at the heart of the project, uh, going from the very smallest viruses up through the uh, metazoans, the zooplankton, going through the bacteria and the protists. And also, we wanted to put this information into a physico-chemical context, because if you don't have contextual information, you can't really understand what you're working with, right? So the physico-chemical context was, was very important too. And we wanted to do this on a global scale uh, because the, the ocean is, is one ecosystem. It's one giant ecosystem, basically. Everything is connected. It may take 10,000 years to get from here to there, but in principle, everything can move around. Um, and so we felt that it was important to, to sample the whole global ecosystem. And so that's what we did uh, between 2009 and 2013. Um, each of these numbers is a sampling point uh, as we went around. And we, we, we started in the Mediterranean. Uh, we went through uh, the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean, 
down around South Africa to the South Atlantic, into the Southern Ocean, and then through the South Pacific as far as Tahiti and Hawaii, then back to San Diego, through the Panama Canal, up to New York, and then over uh, the North Atlantic back to France. And then the following season, the following summer, we did a second expedition uh, going around the Arctic Circle. Okay? And this took six months. Um, so Tara is the first sailboat that has been around the Arctic Circle in one season, um, going through the, uh, the Northeast Passage above Russia, and then going through the Northwest Passage above Canada uh, a, a few months later. Again, doing the same sort of sampling protocol. Um, so that was quite an uh, uh, adventure. Um, uh, 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 but on the other hand, it was quite boring because what we did was always do the same thing. Everywhere we sampled, we wanted to do exactly the same thing so that ultimately we could compare you know, uh, uh, organisms taken here with organisms taken here. <coughs> so we always did the same thing. Um, and here, just to, just to keep you awake, this is uh, a, a bit of a summary of the different plankton nets that we use, different sampling protocols as we were on board. Uh, this is a plankton net with plankton in it. This is a, that was a rosette that we could take down to 1,000 meters to collect seawater, bring up the seawater uh, uh, about 10 liters at a time, concentrate it on, on, on filters, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, that's the rosette coming up. This is filtering seawater with nets of different uh, mesh sizes to capture different kinds of organisms get the organisms onto these membranes and then into the freezers for subsequent analysis. We also had a dry lab on board where we, we could see what sort of organisms were in the water that we were sampling directly to get a feel for exactly what was there uh, to already help us to, uh, to understand what we're looking at. Um, and we also sampled at night so that we could capture different events happening between day and night as, as, as well. So that sort of gives you a feel for, for, for what we did during this, this time. And over um, like three and a half years, um, we using these different sampling methods to collect everything from viruses through to zooplankton, uh, uh, we came back to the, to, to the lab uh, having sampled at 210 sites. And we brought back about 40,000 samples for our subsequent analyses, okay? And then together with those 40,000 samples for biology, we also had additional samples or additional data that would bring in that, that physico-chemical data, which, was, uh, which is so important for, for our work. And basically what we're trying to do um, uh, with, with all of these uh, samples that we generated, um, in a simplistic way, um, if you think about Norwich, for example, different people doing different things, uh, but a microscopic world that you don't know who does what and why they do it, you know. So in understanding these, these planktonic ecosystems, we basically wanted to ask who is there, you know, what kind of organisms are there, uh, what do they do, uh, with whom do they do it, and why, why is it important for the functioning of the, for the well-being of, uh, of the marine ecosystem. And we did this using three uh, 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 parallel approaches. One was very much uh, uh, dependent upon high throughput sequencing approaches, DNA based uh, uh, to sequence uh, 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 size fractions representative of viruses, of prokaryotes, of, of protists, of metazoa, uh, sequencing RNA, sequencing DNA, sequencing barcodes to identify organisms. Um, that was one important approach. Um, a second parallel approach was using high throughput imaging techniques uh, because oftentimes we don't know what these organisms actually look like. So it's very important to generate actual morphological information about them. And then in the third approach, we, 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 we uh, uh, have different physico-chemical uh, 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 analytical pipelines to, to understand the contextual information. So these are the approaches that we started using, and as, as Phil said, we were, we were very pleased that we could uh, publish our first results um, in a special issue of, of science um, uh, uh, one and a half years ago now. So we published five back-to-back -back papers. Uh, we got the front cover, uh, uh, we got the editorial, um, and we even got the, uh, the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> 
This voyage is quite remarkable with a picture of plankton on the front page of the New York Times. So we've got a lot of, uh, we're very proud to have made this, this, this impact with our work. Uh, it's a great achievement for, for any scientist, uh, obviously. Um, so just to go through a little bit what, what is in those papers, <coughs> uh, quite briefly, in, in one paper uh, from Sunogawa et al., we described what we, what we call the Ocean Microbial Reference Gene Catalog. These are basically uh, a catalog of genes coming mainly from bacteria. And we sampled these at 68 sampling sites with pretty global coverage, except for the Arctic, um, at three depths, and, and, and generated a lot of sequence information. And this uh, uh, basically contains 40 million different genes and this catalogue of genes is close to saturation, which means if, if you give me another sample of seawater, then I'll more or less find the same things. I won't find much that is new. So this 40 million is sort of uh, 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 the total number of genes from bacteria in, in, in the ocean, uh, more or less. That, that's a thousand times more sequence than was done before um, from Craig Venter. Um, and is equivalent to about 135 fully sequenced uh, human genomes. So of these 40 million genes, uh, most of them, we don't know what they do. 80% uh, uh, had not been described before uh, the Tara Oceans project, um, and many of them we, we have no clue what they do. So there's a lot of work to do to, to understand what, 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 what functions are encoded by these, uh, by, by these genes. Um, so that's the bacteria. In terms of the viral communities, um, we, we use genomic methods combined with quantitative electron microscopy to see the morphology of the, of the viruses. Um, and what we could describe in this paper is um, about 5,500 viral communities, of which only 39 were previously known. So about 99% of these viral types that we described are completely new to... Uh, to, uh, to, to science here. So that's the viruses. And then for the protists, which I introduced you to briefly before, um, the protists are a very complex world. Um, uh, uh, here you see the diversity of protists in this eukaryotic tree of life. And this is where we are in the animals. Um, and our nearest neighbor here are sponges. Okay, so that's the distance, evolutionary distance between us and sponges. And then you've got all of this diversity as well within the eukaryotic tree of life. One of these branches are the photosynthetic organisms like green algae, red algae, land plants. And there's all of these other guys over here. So we, we know very little about uh, 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 most of these organisms in this tree of life. So what we used here was a, was a barcoding approach uh, using 18S ribosomal DNA. Um, and what we described in this paper was um, about 130,000 different types of, of, of protists, okay, of, of eukaryotes, sorry. About 130,000, uh, uh, let's not say species, but let's not say taxa, but different types of, uh, of, 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 of eukaryotic plankton groups. Again, we have saturation here, so, so 130,000 is more or less everything that is there, at least in the top 100 meters, the photic zone of, of the ocean worldwide. Um, and this is about, uh, this is more than 10 times higher than the number of formally described marine eukaryotic plankton that actually have a species name, okay? So 90% of what we described is new, and about a third of these um, cannot even be assigned to, uh, we can't fit them in the tree, okay? We have no clue where they are. If there may be very, very representatives of very primitive eukaryotes, or, 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 or we, we really don't know why, why, why that is. So um, that, that was a paper that we described, one of the uh, five papers that we described for the eukaryotes. Um, this is all based on DNA sequence, which is kind of boring. It's just one-dimensional, G's, A's, T's, and C's. Um, and it's very important here to... to uh, 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 to put a morphological, uh, to, to, to ascribe morphological information to those DNA sequences. Um, so a work in progress uh, 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 is the development of high content fluorescence microscopy, uh, uh, where we can uh, basically using an automated protocol uh, uh, for confocal microscopy, 
we can generate nice uh, uh, three-dimensional images of, of each organism. Here is a, uh, three examples of that where we have different kinds of eukaryotic uh, phytoplankton and we can see the, the, exo, the exoskeletons of the organisms in, in, in each of these cases. We can see the intracellular structures. This is the nucleus here, the red are chloroplasts inside these cells. And we have, uh, we have about a million of these images now, uh, which we need to relate to this flat DNA sequence information, uh, which, we'll, which we will be doing in, uh, in, uh, in future years, uh, hopefully. So that's work in progress. Some of the things, some of the surprises that, we, that came out from this study. <clears throat> One of the surprises is the, the importance of um, a group of radiolarians called Colodaria uh, that turned out to be unexpectedly abundant. Um, these are some old images from Ernst Haeckel, uh, more than 100 years old, of these organisms. Um, I don't know how many people know, have heard of radiolarians. Yeah, okay, not bad. Colodaria, maybe less so. Uh, they're, they're, they're less well known as radiolarians because they're quite sort of gelatinous. Um, and, and so from the, from the work, uh, 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 from the genetic point of view, using the barcoding approach, we could see the, uh, the, the remarkable uh, uh, abundance of these organisms. Uh, uh, and although they were abundant um, and they were widespread, they're present in pretty much everywhere we sampled at, uh, at, at high levels, um, there's, there's not a lot of genetic diversity. There's only a few genotypes that we could pick out from here. But, uh, but nonetheless, the, the, the genetic data told us that these organisms appeared to be abundant. Um, and then we could relate that uh, genetic data to, to morphological data um, using uh, uh, data from this uh, uh, instrument, which we call a UVP, underwater vision profiler, which is basically, uh, uh, it's a camera you put in the water and it takes images of, of everything that goes through its, uh, its light path. So it takes images and then, you know, with these low resolution images, in many cases you can identify what they are. And these are the, uh, the, the colored area examples that you see here. And so by putting the genetic and the morphological data together, uh, we, we could uh, uh, realize that these organisms are really, really important, uh, uh, really abundant and a really important part of of the uh, of, of of plankton biomass in the ocean, um, this is uh, by by latitude going from um, uh, uh, the, the polar the Arctic region to the Antarctic through the equator here, and this is sort of zooplankton abundance, which is fairly constant as you go from from pole to pole through the equator, uh, whereas the rhizaria, in particular the collared area, increase in abundance, particularly in the tropical regions. And you see they are as abundant, they, they contribute as much biomass in the ocean as do the, uh, the zooplankton in a pretty, uh, pretty large swathe of the, uh, of, of, of the mid-latitudes here. So this is something new, which we obviously, uh, we, we, we ignored really the, the existence, the occurrence of these organisms prior to this survey. Because um, they're sort of gelatinous organisms, they often break apart when people sample them. And, it's only with these new approaches that we could really uh, see them, quantify them, and, uh, uh, and, and, and appreciate their, their potential importance in, uh, in, in planktonic ecosystems. Uh, a second example I just want to, uh, to show you rapidly is um, a group of organisms called diplonemids. Um, so who's heard of diplonemids? Nobody. <laughs> they are the... the they're, turns out to be the most diverse group of eukaryotes in the ocean, okay? They are, they're sitting down here within this group of organisms called dischichristates, similar to trypanosomes, uh, uh, leishmanias, things like this. Um, and, and prior to Tara Oceans, um, there were three recognized species of diplonemids, uh, which you see uh, elegant uh, uh, photographs here, <laughs> three species, uh, 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 and, and with Tara Ocean's uh, uh, exploration of, uh, of, of, of genetic diversity, uh, which we recently published in, in, in Current Biology, um, we could see that these organisms were, were uh, pretty abundant, typically in the deeper region of the ocean. This is 
mesopelagic, which is on average about 700 meters down in the ocean. Um, so they can be abundant, but more than anything, they are hyper-diverse. So we, we can describe more than 45,000 different uh, taxa in principle. So with this one survey, we go from three species up to 45,000. <laughs> so that, that using this, these, these molecular uh, 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 methods. So what are these guys doing in the ocean? I mean, we, we have very little idea. They're, they're certainly not phototrophs. They don't photosynthesize. That we already know. And they're probably um, uh, some sort of heterotrophic uh, 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 lifestyle, either as parasites, symbionts, or, or something like that, which, again, we have to, to explore in the future. Uh, and the step one will be getting some of these organisms into culture. We don't even have them in culture uh, 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 as, as, as yet. So there's a lot of work to do to explore this, uh, this new group of organisms that, that we identify here. <coughs> So um, let's move away from the biology and let's uh, go in a little bit to the physico-chemical uh, constraints on the, on, the, on the biological world. Um, and uh, th there are a lot of different methods available now to, to monitor ocean processes. Um, we have satellite, uh, satellites monitoring like, uh, chlorophyll on the surface of our planet, amongst other parameters. We have arrays of these, uh, of these Argo floats. We have about 5,000 in the world now around the oceans, which are, which are constantly monitoring temperature and salinity and other, other parameters. Uh, uh, uh. And we have other methods as well, gliders and so on, which, uh, which are going around collecting data, sending it back to us, um, which allows us to, uh, uh, to put together with the, the, the data that we collected ourselves <coughs> and sort of go into uh, uh, multi-parametric uh, analyses. So beyond the, uh, the, the complex genetic world that I've already introduced you to, we can combine those millions of genes, all of those different organisms, with environmental parameters from space, uh, uh, from the ocean, other, uh, uh, other sources, and use uh, ad advanced mathematical methods, statistical methods, uh, uh, um, uh, which I'll not go into uh, in, into the details, to sort of see which organisms correlate with which environmental parameters, okay? To try and see what is the relation between the, the physics and the biology of the, of, of the system. So this is very much big data. The, uh, the, 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 the molecular data uh, is already um, the largest set of DNA data that exists uh, uh, in the public databases. And all of the environmental data are also very uh, uh, extensive. But what we can do is to throw all of that information together from all of these uh, uh, more than 60 sampling sites, and we can see uh, uh, who, uh, which organisms do you always find together, or which organisms do you never find together. Relate that to the environment and come up with the social network of the, of the plankton, the ocean's Facebook. Um, to sort of see who is interacting with who and, and why are they doing it. So, so this is the Facebook of the plankton community. Not particularly nice to, to look at. We have eukaryotes in blue and bacteria in pink. And, uh, and, and, and the connections between these organisms are either uh, co-occurrences, where the organisms uh, 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 always occur together, or uh, uh, red edges when the organisms never occur together. Okay, so you have some, some, popular, some popular kinds of plankton that are sort of universally green. These would be sort of the Nelson Mandelas and the, uh, the, 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 the Beyoncés and people like that of the plankton world that are universally popular. And then you have the universally uh, uh, negative plankton, which would be the Trumps and the, uh, <laughs> and, and the Putins and, and whatever. So, You've got all of these, these things. What, what is interesting to, to, to see here, here we have um, uh, uh, 100, uh, almost 130,000 associations between organisms and between the environmental parameters. And what, what struck us here is that, is that most of the interactions that we see here, you know, 90, more than 90,000 are taxon taxon, whereas much fewer are taxon environment. So it's 
so the, the take-home message of this is that the, the interactions between the organisms are more important than the interactions between the organisms and the environment. So it's, important, uh, it's more important who you are living with than whether it's uh, uh, 20 degrees or 4 degrees C in the, in the water sort of thing. So that's, uh, that was quite a surprise to see the importance of the biology in driving, the, uh, in driving interactions. Um, and then a second point is that, is that most of the interactions that we see in these uh, co-occurrence analysis are actually positive. <clears throat> so if we prize that, that hairball apart, we have about 70,000 positive associations between different kinds of organisms and only about 23,000 negative associations. So perhaps what this is telling us is, is that cooperation between the organisms is more important than competition, um, which um, sort of goes against our sort of neo-Darwinian thinking to some extent that we, you know, we tend to view life as competition, survival of the fittest, you know, this continuous fight for survival. But, you know, perhaps what, what this means is that, no, that's not really how it works, but it's cooperation between organisms that together make the ecosystem work. They ensure that it works over different environmental conditions to ensure that the ecosystem is robust. Um, and perhaps that's a nice message uh, uh, that, that we can take home from the, from the plankton from, from this study. So most of the interactions are, are, are positive. Um, however, that is not always the case. Um, and there is one group of organisms, which are the, the organisms that I work on, the diatoms, which, which have an antisocial uh, uh, signature. If we look at co-occurrences versus exclusions, um, we have far more exclusions between diatoms and other organisms than we do co-occurrences, okay? So this sort of would imply that diatoms have few friends and they're very good at keeping their competitors away, okay? Which is kind of, uh, it, it does sort of fit with the ecology of, uh, uh, of, of, of diatoms, which um, as phytoplankton, uh, we, we often uh, associate them with boom and bust proliferation cycles uh, they're, they're very often, they're, they're the phytoplankton which bloom. They're the first to bloom in the spring. And so we always, we do sort of consider them as being kind of competitive. Um, and so this, this, uh, uh, this finding really goes in that same direction. Um, we see exactly the same pattern when we plot this out on a more sort of conventional uh, food chain sort of structure where we have the phytoplankton, different kinds of phytoplankton here, and, and different kinds of zooplankton organized into plankton functional types. And these, uh, the, the edges, the lines between these different groups of organisms will show you whether there are uh, uh, positive interactions between them, and, and the red are the negative interactions. And, and the diatoms are the silicifiers, and you see the red lines uh, between these other organisms uh, very clearly, uh, which is clearly a different strategy to these other phytoplankton here. So, so diatoms seem to have a different strategy uh, uh, for, for survival, for living in the, in, the, in the marine world, which sort of fits with this idea of them being blooming, blooming organisms able to outcompete uh, uh, other, other organisms. <clears throat> okay, so uh, and then another example of what I want to, uh, another example of, of, of associating the biology with the with more physical chemical processes, uh, uh, processes that we don't, uh, that we cannot quantify very easily. Uh, uh, I, I want to give you, uh, uh, with, uh, for, uh, uh, regarding the, the biological carbon pump, this, um, this uh, uh, sinking of uh, primary producers, phytoplankton, and organisms that eat them, the zooplankton and fecal pellets from zooplankton, the sinking of carbon out of the photic zone uh, down into the, uh, the, the interior of the ocean, which, um, uh, uh, which we know a few things about. We, we, we consider that it's often you know, the, the larger kinds of phytoplankton uh, uh, that increase the flux of, of carbon out of the system. It's degradation uh, uh, from zooplankton that, that is very important in this process. Um, and what we can try to do with our data set is to try to ask, well, which plankton species are the, are the plankton that are the drivers of the biological pump? We, we have that data from the surface. 
uh, of, of the ocean, and we have um, information about uh, uh, particles, uh, carbon export, um, again using this uh, uh, camera, this underwater vision profiler, which as we take it down in the ocean uh, uh, through the water column, uh, we generate movies like this. So here it's going down in the water column and you see each of those white things are, are aggregates, aggregated carbon, uh, uh, other kinds of material, which we can quantify through the water column and using uh, uh, Stokes's law, uh, we can get uh, uh, proxies of carbon export from the uh, uh, photic zone of the, of the water column and generate sort of a global data set of carbon export, which, which looks like this. Um, this is down to 500 meters in the water column. And we see there are some areas where there's a lot of carbon flux uh, 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 that, that, we, uh, uh, that we calculate, for example, in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. Other areas, the South Atlantic, where the, the ocean is pretty transparent, pretty clean, uh, very little uh, uh, export uh, calculated by this method. And so we can take this data and we can combine it with, you know, our biological uh, uh, molecular information to sort of see who in, in this hairball is driving this, okay? And again, using approaches that I, I don't want to go into in, in, in detail, um, the, the kind of organisms that, that come out from this analysis as being uh, particularly strongly associated with carbon export um, are, are radiolarians, these guys I introduced you to before, uh, dinoflagellates, and surprisingly, bacteria. And not only bacteria, uh, Synecococcus, but also the viruses that infect the, uh, the, the, the bacteria. So synecophages uh, and Synecococcus uh, are coming out uh, as being strongly correlated with carbon export to the extent that we can predict up to 89% of, of carbon export. So if you give me a sample of seawater, and I see the extent to which these organisms are present, I could tell you with an accuracy of 89% how much carbon is going out of the system, which is pretty, uh, uh, quite pretty useful information, uh, as, as, as you can imagine. So that, that, uh, uh, we, we published that work a few, few months ago, and that <clears throat> I think is nice because it's a, it's a nice uh, 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 idea of, as, it's a nice example of, of scaling from genes to ecosystems try and see who is doing what and what is the, the relevance in the, uh, in the, uh, in, for, for the system. Um, and then in the, uh, uh, in, in the final part of the talk, let me just tell you a, a couple more things where we're going now. Um, I described to you the, the 40 million prokaryote gene catalog, which is saturating at about 40 million. Uh, we've now been sequencing the eukaryotic uh, component of these ecosystems. <clears throat> and uh, we're now up to 115 million different genes, okay, from the same sort of sampling program. So where we have 40 million prokaryotic genes, we have 115 million eukaryotic genes, and it's still climbing. So the more we sequence, the more we keep finding new things. Um, so it's getting scary. So we decided to stop there, and as you can imagine, most of what we found is, is unassigned. We don't know what it is, um, uh, uh, and it has very little uh, uh, overlap with other data sets which are apparently representative of these organisms. So there's a lot of things to do to, to understand what these uh, sequences are. This is just an overview where we look at the most highly expressed eukaryotic genes in the ocean. Uh, using PFAM uh, 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 protein domains uh, by, by size fraction, by taxonomic group, and oceanic region. And the sorts of things that struck us, strike us are importance of genes for motility, uh, extracellular perception and intracellular signaling, uh, translation, uh, which we didn't necessarily expect to see in such a global, uh, uh, such a strong signal uh, at this global level. And also parasitism. So I think parasitism seems to be an important ecological strategy used by these organisms that we need to learn more about. So that obviously doesn't tell you much uh, of, of what's, uh, uh, what's present in this data set, but we can pull out some, some quite clear signals. Um, uh, the, the example up here are um, silica transporter genes from diatoms 
and how the expression of those genes, uh, shown by a, the size of the, of the bubble, how that relates to, to silicate concentrations that we measured at these different sampling sites. Um, and it actually correlates pretty nicely. So the higher silicate levels, uh, uh, the, the lower the expression of the silicon transporters in those samples, which is nice to see. And the same is true for iron responsive genes uh, with respect to uh, uh, estimated iron levels in the global ocean. Again, we see uh, uh, reductions of gene expression as a function of the, the environmental parameters. I think this is, this is amazing to see this. It's gene expression in the wild, in nature. It's not in a, it's not in a flask in the lab, but it's, uh, it's gene expression in a whole community of organisms in a very, very complex environment. But nonetheless, we can see these patterns of gene expression uh, at this very large macroscopic level, which is, uh, which is, which is very satisfying. And then in terms of uh, uh, photosynthesis, we can look at um, light harvesting uh, uh, chlorophyll genes, which as we, we can think could be a sort of proxy for photosynthesis. So here we look at uh, uh, LHC gene expression in different phytoplankton groups here with respect to, uh, 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 to, to chlorophyll pigments that we measured by HPLC in the, in, in the water. And what we see here is uh, uh, in each of these four groups, as uh, chlorophyll levels increase in the different sampling sites, we have increased LHC expression in these, uh, in these four groups, which is, which is nice to see. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the dinoflagellates do the opposite. And what we think is happening here is that uh, 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 because these guys are mixotrophic, they switch from being phototrophs to mixotrophs, so when these other organisms start to, uh, start to proliferate, then the dinoflagellates start eating them rather than photosynthesizing. Okay, so that uh, seems to be something uh, uh, interesting to explore in, in, that, in that direction. <coughs> so um, the take-home messages from this uh, uh, first part of the talk, which is essentially all of the talk, um, is then that don't worry. <laughs> Um, Tara Oceans is the first end-to-end -end description of a, of a global ecosystem. I think that's why science were interested in, in publishing it. Um, the ocean microbiome consists of about 35,000 taxa that are mostly known, uh, containing about 40 million genes, uh, which are mostly unknown. Um, we describe more than 5,000 viral communities, about 99% of them are new. Um, the diversity of the eukaryotes is huge, uh, but it is finite at about 130,000 taxa. About 90% of these are new, and these contain uh, so far 116 million genes uh, with, with no sign of, of, of saturation. Um, so that's the work that we've done so far, and, and uh, we always endeavor to, to make all of, our, all of the data public so that anybody interested can, can, can use it which is obviously very, very important. <clears throat> so then, do I have uh, maximum five? Right, I'll try and just briefly in the last small part of the talk, just, just sort of go beyond the science and, and talk about the, uh, the, 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 the uh, goals of the Tara Foundation and ESB and so on, which, uh, which is to support high quality science, uh, obviously, but it's also to popularize science and to educate uh, the general public about science, which is uh, uh, more and more important in, uh, in, in today's world. Um, so when you have a big boat, you, uh, uh, you, you, you do attract attention. Um, this is as we left uh, Lorient in Brittany in 2009. You see there are a lot of people uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to say au revoir. And this is as we came back from the first expedition uh, in March 2012, you can see the people lined up here, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to, to welcome us uh, uh, and say, great job, guys. And this is pretty much the same, you know, wherever we went in the world. Um, this was in, uh, uh, in New York, obviously, and in New York, we had a special uh, meeting with Ban Ki-moon, uh, who was the current the, 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 the Director General of, UNESCO, of the UN at that time. Uh, we brought him on board. Uh, we had two hours with him. Uh, to really 
talk to him about the ocean, about the importance of, uh, of, of marine ecosystems, about the links with climate and so on. So it's a fantastic moment to, uh, to really bring over the importance of, of, of the science, uh, uh, of ocean science, to, to these very, very influential people uh, uh, on our planet. And, and similar, we also, similarly, we also put a lot of attention into uh, uh, getting school kids on board, getting them interested in, in, in what we do. Um, this is a short video where you see a few different uh, clips from around the world where we got the, uh, the, the young people on board. It's a great moment to, to explain to them. Uh, once you've grabbed their attention with the boat and, uh, and the big sails and so on, you can talk to them about plankton and about uh, uh, the biology of the ocean and about the importance of the ocean and the links with climate and so on. Uh, so it's a great to, to really uh, uh, interact with, uh, with, with the, the less powerful people on the planet as well. Uh, uh, as, you can, as you can see here. So uh, uh, we thought that the, um, uh, the COP21 climate conference in Paris was a great opportunity to try and get this message across about the importance of the oceans for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the climate, for the well-being of our planet. So uh, a, a lot of different organizations got together in this uh, ocean climate platform um, with the objective to, to promote the same message, which is basically to give the oceans of voice at the COP21 Paris Climate Conference in, in December 2015. So you can see different kinds of organizations uh, uh, that got involved in this initiative. We organized a, uh, an ocean day uh, uh, at the COP21. We had a lot of uh, uh, influential people uh, with us, uh, a lot of different things happening around Paris at, at that time. Ban Ki-moon came to see us again. Um, and, and finally, we, we, uh, we got the oceans into the Paris Treaty. Um, we didn't expect to, uh, but uh, by working together, we were able to, to get the oceans mentioned in the, uh, in, in the preamble of the, of the Paris Treaty. Um, this is uh, what says, noting the importance of ensuring the integrity of all ecosystems, including oceans, and the protection of biodiversity, blah, blah, blah. It took about five years to get the, 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 the forests on the, into the climate negotiations. It took about five years. Uh, of, you might think it's amazing. Uh, it took five years for, the, for uh, uh, forest ecologists to get the politicians to realize that, that forests are kind of important in climate regulation. <laughs> It took them uh, uh, five years, uh, uh, and, and we expected a similar battle to, to give the oceans a voice, but uh, uh, we got the oceans in now at the end of 2015. They were talked about in, uh, in 2016 as well, and hopefully th this will continue <laughs> in the future, um, although who knows in the, uh, in, in, in the current uh, climate. So I think that's a nice message where working together uh, 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 many different organizations were able to, uh, to get the message across of the, the importance of the, of the ocean. So uh, let me uh, end by thanking the, all the people involved, um, our sponsors, um, and also different uh, scientific organizations. We're about 23 labs involved. Uh, my lab is just one of, uh, of, of many of those. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and the work that I described to today is, is a summary of, uh, of work from many, many different laboratories. So uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>